still profiting from the arbitrage, except instead of lending at the forward rate, we're effectively borrowing at the forward rate. So that the only thing that can, we can observe in equilibrium, the only thing that could actually be stable out of the marketplace is if those two things are equal to each other. Jesse. Sarah. So the forward rate is something that you can find online. It's like something that's like sure. you know what it is. Yeah. E is that just like according to opinion as to where they think the market will go in the future? Um, I mean, at some level, like the expectation of this whole thing is embedded in the forward rate. So if you tell me, Professor Arbel, I want to know what does the market expect the two-year spot rate to be a year from now? Well. What I would tell you is, let's go look at the, let's see, what did I say, two years, two years from now? Mm -hmm. Let's go look at the forward contract, the two-year forward rate starting two years from now. And if there's no arbitrage, those two things should be equal to each other. So that is the market's opinion. Aggregate everybody's belief about what the spot rate should be. That should be embedded in the forward rate that we observe today. Max. Okay. All right. This is as far as we need to take this if we feel like we understand it. Does this make sense? Does anybody want me to explain any of this again? No? I like that feedback. Very nice. Okay. okay. So, no arbitrage? You believe there's no arbitrage? Then you should believe that forward rates are equal to the market's expectation of future short term rates. Why is this important? This is why it's important. Because. If these two are equal to each other, then I can go back to that equation that we had that we got from the expectations hypothesis. And remember the problem was, we're trying to explain these three characteristics, and we got forward rates everywhere. I want a relationship between long-term rates and short-term rates. Not a relationship between long-term rates and short-term rates and forward rates. If there's no arbitrage, then what I can do is I can replace all of these forward rates with their expectation of future short-term rates. So that what I get is this guy right here. This, in all its heady glory, is the expectations hypothesis. Long-term rates are a geometric average of the market's expectation of future short-term rates. Right? <laughs> no, awesome. I literally do kind of feel like a little like tingle every time I say it. It's amazing. Like, we just built that together for an hour. I mean, we started with that with not even knowing what term structure is. And we put together all these pieces to now say something about long-term rates and short-term rates. Let me flesh this out a little bit. Long-term rates, what did I say? Long-term rates are a geometric average of the market's expectation of future short-term rates. Now we can simplify that a lot. If your intuition from this is long-term rates are an average of short-term rates, good enough. That's close. All right, that's close enough. Long-term rates are an average of short-term rates. Where did it come from? Well, it came from the expectations hypothesis. And now I've said that we're living in a risk-free world, and I'm going to fix that. But other than that assumption, what was the only principle that we needed in order to get that long-term rates are an average of short-term rates? No arbitrage. No arbitrage. That's it. That's really kind of surprising, you know, that this whole relationship drops out. If you believe that there's no arbitrage, that that's a good approximation for the world, then this should hold. Let me, let me um, answer, or let me say one more thing and then, and then I'll field a question that you guys have about this. Why is this powerful? This is powerful because let's go back to those list of three things that you're trying to explain and let's see if this helps us at all. So uh, long-term rates are less volatile than short-term rates. Does this expression, the expectations hypothesis, uh, explain why that would be the case? Yeah. Why? Because an average would take into consideration the highs and the lows. Perfect. It's an average. The average is always less volatile than the constituent pieces. If I were to look at the, the volatility of scores on the first exam across sections, or take the average and then look at the volatility, the volatility is going to be a lot less if I take the average first. Given that long-term rates are an average of short-term rates, it makes perfect sense that long-term rates are less volatile than short-term rates. What about that long-term rates and short-term rates are correlated, that they move together? Yes, why, Curtis? It's an average. If, if, if one person does really well on the exam, then the average for the whole class goes up. An average goes up when one of the constituent pieces go up, goes up. So the expectations hypothesis explains that characteristic as well. That weird thing that we saw in the term structure actually falls out from no arbitrage. Bye. Um, if they do follow, like, if they're correlated that because of an average, wouldn't there be a lag between the short term and the long term? 
No, because remember, I mean, we built this expression, and this expression didn't have any lags in it at all. What fell out of this was no arbitrage. Now, you can think that there might be some noise around this as people are, are taking advantage of arbitrage situations, and I think that's fair. But as a first order approximation of the world, this idea that long term rates are an average of short term rates, I think is pretty good. Maybe it takes a little time to catch up. People are finding arbitrage and chasing away those profits and things like that. But um, in general, this relationship is what we'll see. Okay, what about the last one? The last characteristic we had was long term rates tend to be higher than short term rates. Does the fact that long term yields are an average of short term yields explain why long term yields would be higher than short term yields? It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. Okay, that's the answer. No, it doesn't. If one thing is an average of a bunch of other things, there's no reason why that thing should be higher than uh, than than than, uh, than that set of, of things. Okay. So <laughs> we talked about this. So these two characteristics then that we started with from the term structure that we wanted to uh, uh, explain. We did. However, we were not able to explain with the expectations hypothesis why short-term yields tend to be lower than long-term yields. Okay? So we're going to need another theory, liquidity premium theory. Given that we have five minutes left, don't worry. This one goes a lot faster than expectations hypothesis. This is like the most beautiful uh, model that you've ever seen. Yeah. Did you say that the long-term rates are higher than short-term rates? Yeah, that's the quiddity premium theory, what Bobby just really said. So I don't know if you guys are listening, but he said, didn't we say that, that bonds should have, they have higher risk because they're longer maturity? That's a, effectively what liquidity premium theory says. Liquidity premium theory says that because we're locking up principal for a longer time, you have to be compensated for that. And so typically, risk premiums tend to be greater for longer maturities. How are we going to add that to our expectations hypothesis? Pretty simply. All we do is tack on this risk premium. So then the liquidity premium theory is essentially just to add this piece right here. This isn't R times P. This is just the risk premium. So this is a number that we have that's associated with N. This would come out of some kind of internal model about, well, how much do we think there's default risk? And what do we think about the path of inflation going forward? All these things would be compounded into this risk premium. Okay. Now, why do we tend to think that this is higher for higher maturities? Yeah. <coughs> There's more things that can happen. Exactly. So, if I have a one-year bond versus a ten-year bond, well, the ten-year bond has a higher default. If they're the same on every dimension, the ten-year bond has a higher default rate or a higher default risk. Think about like even a super safe asset like um, the like U.S. T bills. If I have a 10 year T bill, well, there's a possibility that the United States defaults in five years. Well, if I'm holding a one year T bill, then I'm not exposed to that risk. So, longer maturity, higher default risk, higher inflation risk, higher interest rate risk. So, for all the reasons that we talked about why risk is greater with longer maturities, it makes sense that this risk premium should go up with maturity. Okay? So, now we've relaxed this assumption that we're living in a risk free world, and we've been able to do what we set out to do. We took yields and we decomposed them into a risk-free part and a risk-premium part. And these two things together now explain these three characteristics. Okay. Does it explain it? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, so let me say this last thing and then um, I can answer questions if you guys have. <coughs> Why do we care about this? Remember, I want to make an argument for why we care about this because one of the central components of what we're trying to understand in this class is monetary policy. Why does the central bank make the decisions that they make? And you cannot have an intelligent conversation on monetary policy without understanding fixed income markets, bond markets. Today was all about better understanding bond markets. We observed that there was this characteristics that we saw in the term structure, relationships between yields of bonds with different maturities, and we wanted to understand why those, those characteristics make sense. And expectations hypothesis and liquidity premium theory, they gave us that. They gave us this great intuition that long-term rates are an average of the market's expectation of short-term rates plus a risk premium. 
That intuition that we didn't have an hour ago is very, very valuable. Okay. All right, guys. So that's that's everything I talked about. Is there are there questions we've got? Like two minutes. I always hold you guys over, so I should probably just let you out early. Do we have any questions about the things that we talked about today that you guys want to talk about together? Okay.